So we um, we can carry on now um, working in the shadows. Hopefully everyone's roughly caught up. Um, with the shadows, all we're going to look for is a little bit of variation in terms of reflected light back into the, the shadow on the sphere, and then a slightly darker edge at what's sometimes called the bed bug line or the, the terminator, so the point where the, the form is turning from light to dark. So that edge is going to go a little bit darker and we'll go a little bit lighter um, in the center of the shadow. Where the shadow goes a bit lighter, it's fairly straightforward because all we really need to do is mix a little bit more of the um, lemon yellow and a bit of the red just to mix up a color that's similar in um, hue to the rest of the shadow, but just a bit lighter. Um, and ideally, it's good to go a bit higher chroma um, and that's going to happen if we just kind of, if we add um, just pure lemon yellow and the Venetian red to that basic shadow mixture, it's going to go higher chroma because we don't have the blue mixed in that's neutralizing and making it grayer. And we can just paint that straight onto the surface. And then at the edges where it's mixing in to the, the rest of the shadow tone, just sort of soften it off a bit. And then you can get a bit more of that from the palette and just lighten it. And that gives us a, just an ever so slight reflected light in on the inside of that that shadow, which you should just be able to make out, particularly down near the floor, because what's happening is we're trying to paint in the light that reflects off the bottom of the floor up into the, into the shadow. Now, as I say, also, we want to put in a darker tone for the very edge of the shadow, which means we're going to have to, to go darker than we already are. We're going to have to add a little bit more blue. So that's going to shift it to be slightly more grayish, but that's okay. Um, but it's the only way we can get it to go a bit darker. So you can mix up a slightly darker tone and then just place it and see how it looks. Yeah, that's not too bad. We're just going for a, a darker edge to this shadow. you can blend that into the rest of the shadow. So because the oil paint's always wet, you can always sort of blend in, in a single session, you can do a lot of blending. And that's about enough for the, um, the center of the shadow or that core of the shadow, which means we can now move into working in our lights. So what I want you to do to begin with the lights, and this kind of goes back to, to where we're going to be mixing these sorts of uh, lighter tones. Um, we're going to have to figure out what's the highest chroma light color that we can get. And that's going to be the center of our lights and the portion of the sphere in light. Um, we don't want to work kind of straight up just adding white into the mixtures because if we just, as we saw here, if we just keep adding white to something, it's going to go gray. We don't want the lighter tones to feel gray. We want them to still have some saturation, some chroma. So if you take a clean brush, take some white, mix a pool of that on the surface of your palette, and then add some pure yellow and pure red. And you can mix up a light sort of rough flesh tone color. And you can make it whatever value you like. It can be a bit darker. This is just determining the, um, the value of our lightest tone. It's important when painting to be aware of how dark things are going to get. So the darkest sorts of tones that we're going to have in the painting and the lightest tones before we start to put in the in-between tones, the half tones. 
um, because these are our extremes. So this color I'm mixing up now and that I'm going to just place here, this is going to be our lightest tone. Um, and if you were painting a portrait, it would just depend on the sitter basically, but I've kind of just gone for a, a fairly light kind of yellow, yellow reddish tone. So this is going to be the lightest that the, the, um, the sphere is going to go. This is the highlight. So everything else is going to start shifting from this point to being, uh, darker gradually. <clears throat> this is our sort of benchmark light tone. Mixing the half tones from there isn't too tricky because we just start to incorporate gradually more of those darker tones into that original light mixture and just sort of paint them around that highlight. What's important though, is that we try to maintain the same hue. So you don't want it to suddenly shift to being more yellow or more red. Um, and we also want to try to give the sense that as it gets darker, it's also gradually getting lower chroma. Um, so less saturated, which is going to negate that problem of if we just add white to stuff, it'll get lighter, but it'll also get lower chroma. So that's what we're trying to avoid, um, with this process. So basically just kind of gradually painting circles, concentric circles around the lighter tones. And as they, they move further away from the center of that light, they get gradually darker and ideally they go a bit grayer. Now you might shift to gray or you might go too dark. That's okay. We're going to be going back and correcting everything. So as always, it's kind of like your first your best guess first, but then there's always going to be an opportunity to, to correct anything that's not quite right. So I'm mainly working between the shadow color. I'm kind of just incorporating the shadow color into my, that lighter tone that I mixed, which was just pure, pure yellow and red. And then I can kind of gradually blend it into the, the colors on the surface that preceded it. And that starts to create this, the sense of a gradient. And what we're aiming for is to get to this shadow edge and be about the same value as the shadow by the time we reach it. Um, but slightly grayer, um, because the half tones, <clears throat> half tones always shift grayer in, uh, in reality, when you're working from photos, it doesn't actually happen as much. Um, so you can often tell if something's being painted from a photo versus from life, um, the half tones will tend to be more orange, but in paintings that are painted from life, the half tones will tend to be, uh, grayer.
Oh yeah, sorry. Hopefully that's better. So at this point, I've got pretty gray towards the, the half tone, possibly too gray, but that's okay. As I say, we can, um, we can just adjust stuff on the, on the canvas. So I've reached that shadow edge and it's possibly a bit too gray what I've got. So I can try to mix up a slightly darker, darker color that's got a bit more chroma to it. And get that to blend in. Do with more just a bit more color to it yeah so I'll just keep adjusting it till i'm happy till it kind of clicks in so you want to try to develop a sense for if something feels like it it does or doesn't fit um that's one aspect of kind of developing your painting skills but also what's important is obviously knowing kind of how to make a correction so is it does it feel wrong because it's um yeah grayer is not exactly to add brown though these sorts of browns feel grayish um it's more to do with saturation so if you imagine um oh sorry just dropped out i'm just adding them back in someone dropped out so if you imagine um a black and white photograph versus a color photograph. Um, a black and white photograph is just purely gray. So from black to white, pure grays. Um, whereas a color photograph is in is fully saturated. Um, if we were to take a photograph or if I was to take this whole setup that I'm painting um, and put it into Photoshop and make it black and white or desaturate it, take all of the saturation out of the, the image, everything would be gray. But these colors here, they're, they're already closer to gray or the white is closer to gray. Um, whereas these ones are all very saturated, like the yellow is very saturated. It would change a lot if we were to make um, a, a black and white photo. Whereas these ones, these wouldn't really change. They would look roughly the same um, because they're, they're already grayish colors. So when we talk about making something grayer, it's drawing out all of the saturation of the color. Um, what's complex about oil painting is some colors come out of the tube a lot brighter than others. So like the yellow is obviously a very saturated color. The blue is very saturated. The red is not as saturated naturally. It's um, this red is kind of more of a muted earthy red. Um, so it's not got as much chroma as these two have. Um, and when we mix things together, as you saw, by mixing these three together, we, we create a gray. But if we just mix two colors together, we don't create grays, we create transitions um, through other hues. So like the blue to the yellow makes a green, which is our sec one of our secondary colors. So these are our primary colors. Blue to yellow makes green, which is a secondary. Blue to red makes a purple secondary. Um, and red to yellow makes a sort of orange secondary color. But if we mix all of them together, like if you mix everything, you end up with this kind of muddy gray brown. Um, so when you're mixing paint um, and you kind of start, everything starts to get a little bit kind of mix, over mixed or um, 
we call it kind of muddying it down. So the painting becomes sort of muddy is what people refer to. And what they really mean is it's sort of all of the paints are mixing. So they're becoming grayish, um, but there's nothing wrong inherently with um, a gray color. So grays are very useful all through the painting. Generally, you won't have that many really pure colors um, in, a, in a sort of classical painting tradition. If you're painting um, in an impressionistic fashion, pretty much everything is pure. Um, but looking at painting from a um, sort of academic traditional viewpoint, brown uh, sort of grayish colors are used a lot. Um, and part of the reason for that is people didn't used to have access to as, as bright colors as we do nowadays. So a lot of these brighter colors that we're working with are synthetics. Um, and traditionally, pigments had to be mined and either mined or created in various different ways before they were turned into oil paints. Um, and so the brighter pigments very often were actually harder to come by. The more kind of earthy pigments were easier to find or easier to dig up. Um, so they tended to use more brown, a kind of more brown palette to begin with. Um, and in order to make things like the, the highlight on this sphere feel lighter and higher chroma, everything else had to be made brown around it because saturation is relative. If, if I've whacked this color here, just in an, in the middle of the gray field, it would feel very bright, very high chroma. Um, but if I put this color in the middle of this yellow, it would feel relatively gray. Um, Hopefully that makes some sense. Saturation and chroma or kind of grayness um, and saturation are probably the trickiest things to sort of understand with painting, but they are important to try to get your head around. Um, because if you're not really aware of them, it's a lot harder to control what's going on in your painting. Um, but that's certainly what makes color mixing really complex um, is that extra sort of aspect, um, which is chroma. So not only are you working with value, so if you're drawing, you're just working with value because you're working with black and white. Um, and then hue is fairly straightforward because we always, we kind of naturally think of things as, you know, is this a yellow or is this a blue or a green? Um, what I'm doing now is I'm just kind of evening out these transitions, I'm trying to make them a bit more complex. So where it feels too abrupt, <clears throat> I'm trying to soften that and create more transitions up towards that lighter tone while keeping a, a sense of that, that shadow edge. Um, so yeah, hue is, hue is a bit more straightforward because we can talk about whether something is blue or green quite happily. We, we do that quite a lot just generally, but saturation is a more complex concept, but all three kind of interact. Um, so sometimes if you, if you just add white to something, you're making it lighter, um, but you're also making it grayer. So it's not as simple as if the painting gets lighter, you just add white. Cause if you do that, you'll end up with something that looks quite washed out. Hopefully that <laughs> makes some sense, my, my answer to your question. As I say, it's a, it's a tricky concept to explain and get your head around. Once you understand it, it, it sort of makes sense and, and clicks in.
So that's roughly um, sort of where we want to be at with the painting. I'm going to just check in with my um, my tutored students. Um, this is about what you're aiming for in terms of kind of finishing both exercises. Um, I'll, when I come back, I'm going to just talk about things that maybe don't quite work so well with mine and how I could tweak that or kind of play around with it, just to give you an idea of um, what you would need to alter um, to kind of perfect things. But this is roughly, if you can get up to this stage by the end of the session, that's good. Um, but I'll carry on a little bit and explain some more stuff when I'm back. Um, but yeah, I just want to check in with the my tutored students. So I'll be back in a moment. Um, so I'm back now. Um, Paola, if you want today um, tutorial, let me know to send a message. And I'll open the, um, the breakout room back up. Um, but yeah, we're, we're kind of into the last few minutes of the, the session. So hopefully you've sort of roughly caught up to about this stage. Um, it is tricky, so it's definitely not easy to kind of balance these tones. Um, let me know if you have any particular questions or anything that anyone found particularly difficult. Um, just chat in, just put it in the chat box and I'll answer your questions. Um, but hopefully it's reasonably clear the process. One important thing about the process or important thing to remember is just that it's, um, it's always a case of just gradually adjusting things. You don't have to necessarily get it perfect um, right at the beginning. Um, so you don't have to put the perfect color down. While I'm painting, I'm always making adjustments. So I'm either adjusting colors on my palette or I'm adjusting colors on the, the piece itself. If you find that things start to go, um, the highlight is a mixture of yellow and red and white. So there is some white um, in that highlight, but I tried to avoid putting too much. Basically, I tried to figure out how light can I get it. So if I have um, yellow and Red is my starting point. Um, so I can mix it up again now. I was actually going to mix some up. So I was going to say, if you want to kind of bring, if things get a bit too muddy, you can kind of go back and paint your lighter tone back into the, the highlight. So if I take a bit of my lemon yellow and a bit of my red and mix them together, make my sort of light orange, sort of yellowy orange. Um, so that's the, the kind of pure yellow and red mixture up there, which is obviously much more yellow than what I have on my, my painting. Um, I then mixed, I can mix white into that and mix a bit of red. So white into that to get it to a value that I'm happy with and a hue that I'm happy with. So I don't want it to feel too yellowy. I also don't want it to go too white. Let's say something like that possibly. Um, so 
to end up with something about like that. So if I make, paint that back into the, um, the sphere, you can see it's a bit higher chroma than what I have around it because it's, it's mostly just made up of pure, um, pure red and yellow, a little bit of white mixed in. Then I can blend that into my my other half tones. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Katrina. Yeah, it's very, very, very tricky chroma. So if anyone else who found it difficult, don't worry. It's a, it's a, always a difficult thing to try to explain as well. Um, it makes a lot of sense once it, it clicks in and you sort of understand it, you start to see it a bit more clearly. But it's the main thing I think that is a bit of a stumbling block for, um, for color mixing when people are first starting out with color. Because you can sort of work without knowing about it, um, but it, it sometimes just creates problems that you don't necessarily understand, like why something is going wrong. So yeah, mixing up that slightly purer color and reinforcing the highlights just kind of made the giving it a bit more life again, just because it went slightly too drab. So if if things end up going a little bit too gray, you lose that sort of uh, luminosity of the color. So um, going back, cleaning your brushes and mixing up something sp just specifically out of the red, yellow and white will then kind of lift it. As you work, things tend towards grayness because you'll mix all your colors will start to get a little bit sort of excessively mixed. And so um, you can always kind of go back in and paint pure color, but pure colors back over the top um, to correct that. Oh, great. That's really good to hear, Lynn. Yeah, that's the idea mainly to get people uh, working in oils. But the important thing is, um, I think one of the important sort of takeaways from working with oils is that they're more forgiving than people think they are. Because I think often um, people are a bit intimidated by oils or they're not necessarily seen as something a beginner would try. Um, but I actually find oils a lot more easier to work with and more forgiving than a lot of other media things like people often start with watercolor, but I mean, watercolors are a very tricky medium in terms of layering and, um, the fact that you can't make corrections. Um, as you saw with this, like I'm constantly making corrections in oil paint. So nothing's ever sort of totally set in stone. And beyond even kind of like correcting things on the on the painting itself while it's all wet, um, you can go back to stuff and correct things. Um, you know, once everything's dried, it's a lot easier to go back over a, a dry oil painting. Um, but you do have the opportunity because it stays wet for so long. You can kind of keep re keep reworking sections um, 
sort of to your heart's content. There does usually come a point where you maybe end up with a little bit too much paint on the surface. But generally you can kind of keep reworking things for quite a while. It's so probably one last touch I might kind of try to reinforce um, just at the end here is just to try to get that really dark note at the bottom of the sphere. Um, that type of shadow, if you're interested, is called a, an inclusion shadow. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, definitely um, try out another one or, I mean, I would recommend if you've done this uh, intro sort of workshop or followed through or followed along with it, the um, My Landscape painting sessions are, are good to take because um, a, a lot of what we kind of learn here, we apply with the landscape painting. Um, but it's sort of working with a reasonably kind of forgiving, quite fun subject, not as, as tough as something like uh, a portrait painting or something like that. Um, and you can also, so this, this exercise I was saying to one of the, the full tutored students, um, you can, you can sort of create a version of this, uh, working from a still life. If you use just something like an egg as a subject, um, which can help a bit in terms of kind of mapping out your sphere. Cause it can be a bit tricky, um, to sort of just sort of throw a sphere together, um, out of imagination when you're not used to it. Um, but the egg, if you kind of work from an egg, it gives you a sort of a structure to work to. Um, Marie just asked when my next landscape workshop is, it's, um, not actually scheduled yet, but I'll, I'll send you an email once it's scheduled. I should have one, I think in September, my most recent one was just like a week ago or something like that. And I've not actually got one booked in for September, but. Um, I'll let you know when I do. Um, if any of you wanted to try out a, a kind of a more involved painting workshop, I do have a portrait painting in oils workshop coming up, um, starts, I think around the 13th of September or something like that. Um, and we'll be using a similar, again, a similar palette and actually the sort of approach to rendering um, flesh tones is, is obviously quite similar to this because that's sort of our, what we're working from or what we're working towards with this exercise. But yeah, otherwise I'd recommend the, the landscape workshops are a good sort of beginner um, subject to work with and something that you can also sort of do yourself um, in your own time if you want to go out and landscape paint or make your own landscape paintings yeah they it'll be so on my website so if you go to scumbleandglaze.com um, there's a link to live workshops um, and that'll take you through to my eventbrite which has all of the the workshops. I think if you signed up through Eventbrite, you probably get emails about it as well. Um, and if you subscribe to my mailing list, um, which you may have done when subscribing, you'll get, get details too. Um, but otherwise I do post about them on, if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, I always post upcoming workshops as well. So hopefully should be able to be seen somewhere, but yeah, if you, if you want to keep up with, um, everything that's going on when stuff's announced, I recommend signing up to my mailing list um, on the website. Um, Cause I always send through kind of schedules for each month whenever I've got new workshops lined up. So I've got a few booked in for September, but they're not, um, not all totally finalized yet.
but yeah, we're just about time. Um, so I'll probably stop fiddling around with mine. So let me know if you have any final questions about anything. Um, yeah, it's a, so what I'm working on is just like a linen, um, oil primed canvas from Jackson's. Um, so I've just got like a massive roll of it. So it's just a scrap from, from that, 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 um, roll. Yeah, what I'd recommend is the simplest thing to do is put some just acrylic gesso. Um, it's usually advisable if you're working straight over canvas um, to put some um, uh, some sort of size that's called. So traditionally rabbit skin glue is what people use before acrylic primer, but um, nowadays you can use thin down PVA glue is okay. Or there's a thing called GAC 100, I'll just write what it's called in here which is made by golden um and you can get bottles of those they last for ages but it um yeah yeah the pva glue i mean in theory they do say gesso the gessos that you buy from stores block the canvas effectively but i've always been told from an archival point of view um, it's best to put another layer. So like, uh, either GAC 100 or PVA, some sort of extra layer of, um, glue basically between the, the canvas and the, the paint. Um, and then it just, sorry. Yeah. Between, between the canvas and the gesso. So the first coat you put is the PVA over the, the raw canvas. Um, you will also find, so very often when you prime canvas it tightens the weave um so what you can do is you can put the canvas on your stretcher bars then paint it and then that'll kind of naturally tighten it um 